Hi, my name is Cecilia Puna, and welcome to this episode of Brave New Women. All around the world, there are amazing, ordinary women doing extraordinary things. Brave New Women is about giving those women a platform and a voice, and it's about changing the way that women are perceived. And it's a way of inspiring all of us to do the things that we've always wanted to do. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking to Christine Stewart. And Christine Stewart is actually my mother. Um, so it's, it's, very, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be interview, interviewing my own mother. Um, Mum has just published a book which is called Collets In, Uncovering the Past. This is actually my second interview with Mum. And the first was on the restoration of Collets In. And in this interview, we're going to focus on the book. So Mum, welcome. Thank you, Cecilia. Lovely to talk to you. Mm. So, Mum, for, for people who haven't listened to the first interview, uh, could you just give us some information? What is Collets Inn and why is it so important? Well, Collets Inn uh, was built in 1823, which for Australia is very early. It's not the earliest in, uh, in, in New South Wales. That was the Macquarie Inn at um, Windsor in 1818, but it was the first inn on the other side of the mountains after the mountains were crossed. And they weren't crossed till 1815. And it took some time before people could actually get permission to to go across, a bit like with the virus now. Um, but in 1821, Pierce Collitz, who was a, a convict who'd come out and he'd been freed, that's quite another story. And I've got a chapter in the book about all that. Uh, he asked for permission to bring some cattle across to the other side of the mountains, to the Fish River. And uh, there's a beautiful letter written by him to um, Governor Macquarie uh, after that trip saying he'd found the site for an inn for the comfort, comfort and convenience of settlers. And he goes on about that. It's really very flowery and very interesting. And uh, just at the bottom of... They had to come down uh, a road called Cox's Pass, which was when you walk it today, you could hardly imagine that anyone could bring a, a dray down there because it's so rocky and precipitous, and it was very dangerous. It took all day to get down there. But below is a beautiful valley with a very flat area and um, uh, an ideal spot for an inn, except for having to bring everything 70 miles by bullock dray. <laughs> can imagine. So that's where he, he wanted to build it, and he was given a grant of 200 acres, and that's where the inn is built. Was he one of the first people to um, actually go across and take cattle across after it had been discovered, or had there been people um, going across before that, between the time the mountains were crossed and when he went across? I think there would have been people going out to Bathurst and um, because they were crossed in 1815, and this was 1821. Um, so crossed in 1813, then the road was opened in 1815. Mm -hmm. So I think there would have been people going across. In fact, Mac uh, Governor Macquarie went across in 1821. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of history that he's supposed to have stayed at the inn, but as the inn wasn't built till 1823 and he went back in 1821 uh, to England, um, that couldn't possibly have ever happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me about um, writing the book. Why did you want to write a book about Collettsin? Well, I was, I'm really a, a painter, so that was what I was doing. But um, we had a good friend who's unfortunately now died uh, called John Cody who worked for Random House. And uh, he said to me when we first bought the inn, um, you should write a story about this and bring the emotion into it because it's such a fascinating place. And uh, that was back in 19, um, 1999 or 98, I can't remember. And it wasn't till um, 20 years later that, uh, or actually 2020, that I started to write. And I, I'd sort of, we sold the inn in 2007 and it had sort of been tugging away at the back of my mind that this was a fascinating story. And we made so many discoveries that many people don't know about that I just felt I should do it. And um, I gave up my painting studio in February 2020. I sat down to write and COVID came exactly then. 
which gave me a lot of space in my life to actually do it. So it was published in August this year. And um, what was, how did you go about researching what was going to be in the book? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, because I'd had to write, if, if, if you restore a heritage building, as most people know, probably, you have to have a conservation management plan. And because it was such a in important building, really, in the history of New South Wales, we felt that it should be done properly. And uh, Tapeo Historian would have blown our budget out or we would have had not very much history. So the architect said that he would show me what to do. And so I spent two years actually researching it when we restored the inn. And so the conservation management plan is actually 100 pages long. So I'd done a lot of research, interviewing people, went to the archives office, went to the Mitchell Library. And uh, so I'd really done most of the research before I wrote the book. And I also realised that anything we did to the inn, right from the start, I bought these um, six diaries and uh, I um, was writing up diaries as we went along. And so when the time came to write, write the book, I sort of went through the diaries and uh, kind of fell into subjects. And I did have to do a little bit more, but most of it had already been done. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to write it so quickly, I don't think. And how did you find, I mean, as you say, your, your, main, your main activity was as a painter. How did you find the process of really becoming a historian and a, and a researcher? Well, in some ways, I almost found it easier than painting. <laughs> really hard. Um, and uh, I really rather enjoyed it. So um, researching is fascinating and uh, sometimes it's very boring, but then you find something like that letter I was talking to you about and that's really like catching a fish. You know, you sit by the riverbank for hours board stiff and then suddenly you've got a quivering fish on the end of your line and uh, research is a bit like that. And so when you're sitting, say you're sitting in the archives office, what sort of things were you looking at? uh, Well, because Pierce Collitz was a convict and because all the people working for him were convicts, they kept very good records about the convicts in those days. So I got a very good picture of the inn because he'd be asking for sawyers and stonemasons and so we could tell when he was building. And also because he was a publican, um, they had publican records, so we knew the name, you know, what the inn was called. And then all the because it was the only building um, in that part of the Wasmoyne's farm, which was built in 1818, but that's not actually on the same map. It was the only building in that area, um, and the the surveyors used it as the measure. They'd say Collets into Bathurst is so and so number of miles. So we had all their records as well, and there were some beautiful old maps too, which I've put in the book. So I, I spent five weeks in the archives doing all that, and. Uh, then I moved across to the Mitchell Library, which is the Australiana section of the New South Wales State Library. And when I first arrived, they only had three mentions um, in the Collets Inn database, and they were all for the operetta. But by the time I'd finished, I had six pages of, uh, of references, of newspapers and uh, articles and photographs and so on. So I spent a long time there as well. So that was all really interesting. Were the, were the staff very involved? Were the staff helping you in the archives? In yes, the archives? in both places. Um, uh, uh, there was a uh, there was a woman at the archives office who was um, she was a dwarf, and uh, I'd go to the desk thinking nobody was there, but she was extremely fi- efficient, and she was, <laughs> she was great and. Um, then at the um, library, they were very helpful too. So um, I had a lot of help. Mm. And um, how is the book organised? 
Uh, well, it kind of fell into chapters, so I've um, I've done it really as a personal story, not a dry history. It's really a story of how we discovered the inn, how we came to be in the area, because we were there 23 years before we bought the inn. And uh, um, then I talked about who Pierce Collitz was and who had owned the inn, and it kind of tracked our discovery of it through. And then there were things like um, the roads being built at the time, the surveyors, this whole chapter about that. And then there were a lot of things that are very that are actually unique at Collitz Inn. One is the operetta. There's the, the ten pages about that. And then um, the discovery of all the linoleums. And I read an article in a magazine called Interiors that said it was the largest collection in Australia, which surprised me. So we actually made a poster of that called uh, the the uh, linoleums of Collitz Inn. <laughs> <laughs> which actually came up rather beautifully. Mm. So um, I've got that on my website too, so people can see all this. Mm. Uh, and then there were other interesting things too, which are in the book. Tell me about the um, finding about the operetta. Um, well, as you know yourself, when we were first, um, when we lived behind the inn, we we didn't really take much notice of it because it was very derelict and falling down. It was painted in, the walls were bright turquoise and the windows were bright yellow. <clears throat> it was probably a job lot of paint that they bought. And it had fibro down one side and an old barn and stables that were falling down. And uh, so we weren't interested in it at all. But we kept hearing a story about how the um, daughter of the Collets had fallen in love with a bush ranger, and how the captain of the guard had been also fallen in love with her and had shot the bush ranger. So we thought it'd be fun to make a little children's film of this, which we did. And you were in it. You played the part of Amelia, who mm-hmm. <laughs> was called Mary in the operetta. And so it took quite a long time before I discovered that this was actually a very important operetta when it was actually produced. Um, They even had a a ball at David Jones, which was the biggest department store in Sydney. And they closed off one of the main streets of Sydney for a corroboree and a march of the Redcoats. I mean, I've never, ever heard of any other musical event where they have done that. So Mm. this was back in uh, 1834. It ran in Melbourne first in 1833. So so it was, uh, it was a sensational triumph, actually. Mm. Mm. Um, so that was very interesting. One of the things, I've, I've read the book, and one of the things that really fascinated me was the, um, the story of the murder. Can you tell us that story? Yes, that's quite gruesome. Um, in those days, because there was such a shortage of women, A lot of men in their 20s were marrying girls as young as 13 and 15. And uh, William Collitz, who was the youngest son of Pierce and Mary, married a girl um, called Caroline James, who was only 13 at the time. And uh, she and her sister and and, um, her sister married a man called John Walsh. And Caroline ended up cohabiting with her sister and John. Um, And uh, one night they were drinking at the inn at the bottom of the Victoria Pass, which is the, as you come down the mountains to the plains beyond, that's, that's, uh, you you have to come down Victoria Pass. And there's a a beautiful stone building at the bottom, but at that stage, that was the um, Coach and Horses Inn. And... uh, The others were not drinking alcohol, but John was. And then he drank two glasses of brandy and he became completely intoxicated. And uh, um, Caroline's husband arrived, William, and Caroline screamed out, he has a stone and he will kill you. And so William ran away and Caroline held um, John back. And then they walked up the pass. So John and and Caroline... John and Caroline. 
the next morning, the coachman came down and he saw what he thought was a bundle of clothes lying on the pass. When he got out, it was Caroline with her head bashed in and a stone covered in blood and hair, which exactly fitted into the wound. And uh, so it was prophetic that she was had saved her husband from that, only to die from it herself. So John was hanged for that because he tried to say it was bushrangers that had done it, but he'd done that once before, and unluckily for him, he came up in front of the same judge who realised he was being told the same story. Mm. So this time he was hanged in Bathurst. Mm. Mm. So it's not a not a very happy story. But, but what uh, fascinated me was what you said about um, people who went past that place later. Yes, it's it's. I mean. A lot of people don't believe in ghosts, but um, there's a lot of uh, stories about people whose hair stood on end when they went past or the horse wouldn't move on. And even a school teacher, I won't give his name because I don't want to embarrass him, but he told um, a uh, surveyor that I was, was had, had a lot to do with that he came down the pass and he saw a bundle of clothes and he rang up the police to tell them about it. And they said a lot of people report that, but there's nothing there. And even even last year, we were contacted by a very down-to-earth couple who I think he's the president of the bowling club in Lithgow, and he um, had some um, manuscripts to give us because he was a descendant. And he told us a story of having gone into um, Hartley Village to the place where the, the old inn was, um, and they were, they all felt so frightened that the whole car load, they, they just went back to Lithgow. Mm. That wasn't on the pass, but that was where Caroline had worked at the inn. And I, th- I said, what were you frightened of? And he didn't seem to be able to say, he said, it seemed to be a man on a horse. And I thought maybe that's, was John Walsh. <laughs> and, but it was so strange because he didn't mind me telling this story, but He's, he's not somebody who would just make things up. And, and there were four of them in the car. So I found all that quite interesting. Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Mm. And what, what are your favourite parts of the book? Um, well, funny enough, I think the part that I feel the most moved by is my interview with Ollie Lack- Lackband. And Ollie is a, a man who's just worked away with his metal detector. He loved going over the old stockades and he knows all the history of them. A lot of them were being denied by the heritage office and said they didn't exist. But he was able to say what regiments had been there because he found the buttons and uh, regimental badges and things. And he had such a lot of interesting things to tell me that um, I I did an oral history to put into the um, Mitchell Library. I was taught how to do that. And uh, I thought, I'm going to put it into the book in in its entirety. Uh, There are a lot of people around the area who've read his work, and it was completely banned by the Heritage Office because he didn't have a university degree, but he knows much more about it than any of the archaeologists. Mm. So I think that's probably my favourite part of the book. Is he still alive? Yes. Mm. Yes, I... uh, contacted him the other day and he said, oh, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> and, and what's also, his actual profession? Ah, good question. I would have no idea. He, he, he never allowed us to pay him anything. And so uh, he came and did a little bit of work around the inn until we got permission from the heritage office. But then the next day we got a furious phone call. Somebody else must have objected and they stopped him doing anything, which was a great shame because... We only found a few. I think it had been well gone over in the past. But because of that, because he wouldn't take any money, I gave him a copy of my conservation management plan, which was so lucky that I did because he rang me a couple of days later. When I gave it to him, he said, you've made my day because he just loves the history. And he said that um, on the property that um, my mother-in-law owned, uh, there was a, a house was drawn saying William's house and I t- hadn't taken any notice of it. I just thought maybe some people called Williams had lived there. 
He said, that'll be Piers Collard's son's house. And we thought, what shall we do? Because if we tell the heritage office, it'll just be fenced off and no one, it'll be lost forever. So we decided we simply had to go up there. And I thought, Ollie has found it, so he should be the one to do it. And it was really exciting because he can tune out what he calls, um, so that he just picks up better metals, as he calls them. And we found out where the fireplace had been. Uh, we found out found out, uh, the leg of an armchair, so we knew that was the sort of living area. We found a beautiful, uh, it looked like the um, side of a powder horn and it had a man with a um, pointer dog. Uh, it was silver. So uh, he said there was must have been a thatched roof because there was no, no iron around. And uh, we found a lot of belt buckles of men and only, not many things of women, a lot of old China. So that was, that was an area that we'd ridden over many times and we just knew, didn't know anything was there at all. So that was really very interesting. Mm. And later on, I got the, um, the surveyor to come up so we would do a proper survey and so it wouldn't be lost. But mm. um, I think it would have just been lost if we hadn't done that. Do you know why William was living why his house was so close to the original Collets Inn? Well, I think I've often wondered whether um, William was a bit mentally retarded because his mother was 45 when she had him, which in those days was quite old, and his father put three notices in the paper, which I've got in the book, saying that my son is an idiot and do not lend him any money because he hasn't got any idea of business. So obviously he was somebody who couldn't really manage very well. And uh, Pierce left him land in his will and then changed his mind. And so obviously uh, William was always a bit of a problem. Um, so maybe maybe he just lived near his parents so they could keep an eye on him. I don't know. He was married to Caroline at that stage. Mm. Uh, and after she was murdered, he married somebody else that same year. And how many descendants are there of the um, Collets family? And um, how have they treated the um, the, the how, how have they um, what's their reaction been to the book? Well, they've been absolutely wonderful because um, a lot of them they're very proud of their ancestor, quite rightly, because I mean. He was just a lowly porter and a thief in uh, England, but he came out here and he met five governors and he had the foresight to build an inn and um, he set up all his sons in farms and his daughters in inns. So it really is quite a remarkable story. And uh, so when I first, um, when we first bought the inn, um, somebody called Bob Morris came and told me who I should contact and uh, there's a woman called Lorna Hawkins, who was one of the descendants, who went over to Ireland and she investigated um, their marriage and she never found any birth records of of, um, of Pierce, even though he always said he was born in Kilkenny, which is interesting. Um, I discussed that in the book. And um, there were people like Sue Graves and uh, Bob Wright, who've all written things, and they've all been helpful and they don't they seem to have really enjoyed the fact that I've done this. I've had orders of books from them. Mm. So I think I think they're actually thrilled that um, because that was all about the history of the family, whereas this is the history of the inn uh, mostly. Mm. Mm. And have you learnt anything additional since the book has been published? Have, it, have people um, come to you with uh, unknown facts or anything? Um. I did speak to some people out of Canoundra and there's a 92-year-old woman there called Dorothy Balcom who's very interested in the history and she sent me some photograph, beautiful photographs which I wish I'd seen before I could have put in the book. One is of um, James Collett's outside one of the inns at uh, Little Hartley, probably Ambermere, the Rose Inn, I think. So it's probably only that so far. Mm. Mm. but I'm, I may find more things because there's a big gap in, 
in the history. I couldn't find out what happened between 1833 and 1839. So I think I probably, when if I do go out to Canoundra, I might find that he was out there because Canoundra, that's a western New South Wales town, was actually built on his property. So on they, James Collett's property? No, on Pierce's property. Oh. He, he did go out there. And uh, so there may be more more to discover there. So Pierce Collett, he left Collett's Inn and, and went to live in Canoundra or he had his, had both properties? Well, what happened was that um, when um, they were going, to, when they opened Lawson's Long Alley, they were going to take the road past Collett's Inn and out to Bathurst. But the Surveyor General, um, Sir Thomas Mitchell, insisted that the road should come down Victoria Pass. And that meant that in 1832, when it opened, that Collett's Inn lost all its business. And as compensation, they gave him three acres at Hartley Historic Village to build another inn, and um, the other uh, 237 acres, because 200 and, is it 200? Um, or three, 337. Anyway, half half a square mile, and the other at Canoundra. So he obviously had a property out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've gone to a lot of trouble in one chapter. There's a chapter called Myths and Puzzles because there were quite a few things that I couldn't uh, work out and others we did work out. Um, I mean, one of the most interesting ones is that, that he was reputed to have had a tenth child, but I think we've proved that it wasn't his child. But that took his child, was it? Well, I went through each. It had to be, it was writ- written in the muster of 1824, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, that uh, his child, Mary Collitz. And I thought that's strange because he, and we went through and we realized that if it had been their child, Mary would have been 51, which seemed not impossible but unlikely. And also Pierce had said that um, just the year before, something about having nine children when she would have been three. So she wasn't his, their child. So then I went through each of the children and could only have been James, who was 15. So that was our answer to the problem. Mm. It's mm. correct. I'm not sure. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and um, how can people get hold of the book? Well, I um, you can buy it on various websites, but it is very expensive because it's a um, premium colour book and it's 132 pages and it's got 199 photos in it and illustrations and things. So I decided for for Australian people that I would have some printed in um, China and uh, they should arrive at the end of November. I have, I am flying some out for those people who've already ordered or, and I can, I'm flying out about 200 and there's still some spare if people want to put their names down for those. And I'll be selling those wholesale at $35 for the paperback and uh, $50 for the hardback, which is a fraction of what they are on the other sites. Um, The best thing to do really is to look at our website, which is uh, colletsinbook.com. It's best to put in HTTPS before it, um, because otherwise you seem to get the other Collets in sites. I had a bit of trouble. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you can contact me through that if you want to. And I, I do keep up the news each when it happens. I mean, I was interviewed this morning on um, or on Saturday on uh, Central West Radio for 10 minutes. So I put that link in for anybody who wants to hear that. Mm-hmm. And I'll put this one in. Good. So, so um, that's probably the best way to do it, I think. Mm. And, Mum, is there anything that... Um we haven't covered that you'd like to any anything else that we need to to say that 
um, before you um, bring this to a close? Well, it's probably, I mean, there's a lot of, there are 40 chapters in the book, so I uh, I think probably that's long enough and people can, if they, if they want to, if they're interested, they can read about it. You can actually buy it as an e-book too for only $11. Um, you can get that right now, and that has got all the pictures in it. So if you don't want, want to actually own a book, that's another way to do it, and you can go to the usual sites, Amazon or whoever, um, to do that. Oh, um, thanks, Mum. I mean, it's um, I've read the book, and I was really struck by, first of all, how well written it is. It's very lively. Um, the the amount of research you've done is absolutely incredible and the attention to detail is extraordinary. Um, and it's such a great vision of um, not only the inn and the Collett's family, but also that whole area and what it was like living in, in, in Australia and in Hartley Valley in, at the beginning of the 19th century. So it's a it's a real insight into um, that that part of Australian history. So, congratulations! It's a it's a huge achievement. Oh well, thank you, Cecilia. I must say it was very interesting for me because I've done things. I also uh, researched things like the shale mines, which are such an integral part of Hartley Vale, which used to be called Petrolia Vale um, because of the uh, when they found the shale there. Um, and the surveyors and all the stockades. So it's actually it's a very interesting area, and uh, I love doing it. So it wasn't it didn't seem like hard work to me. Mm. Anyway, thank you for that. That's very nice to hear. Mm. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Mum. Thanks for your time. Okay. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Brave New Women. Certain podcast sites such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts or Podchaser let you leave a rating and a review. The more ratings and reviews we get, the more people will listen and the more these women's stories will be shared. So I'd really appreciate it if you could. Thanks for listening.